Matthew chapter 7. Turn there, Matthew chapter 7. Um, I've got way more verses to preach than I've got time today, which is, I like it that way. I, oh, I'm not kidding you, I always have a fear I'm going to run out of verses. Or I'm going to run out of something to say and let you out early. That's a fear of mine. How dare I do that? Yeah. So, uh, this will be something we'll probably continue on next Sunday. It's a, it started out this week on Pastor Mike Online, which I didn't get to finish Thursday, but uh, started out looking at the mark of the beast and what that is and, and uh, what it's not. And there's a lot of hype on the internet, a lot of trash going around. Don't listen to that. Read your Bible, people. Listen, you, God's not going to let us accidentally take the mark. It's not going to happen that way. They're not going to put a gun to anybody's head. Satan didn't force Eve to do anything she didn't already want to do. He just brought it to her awareness and let her make the choice. And she made it. She did exactly what was in her to do. And we've all got it in us. Amen. And um, but so they're just just don't listen to a lot of that garbage on the Internet. Don't let it frighten you. Don't let it fool you either, because these people who put this stuff out are never going to apologize when all their predictions don't turn out the way they said. And the rules in the Bible for a false prophet is they only have to be wrong one time. And I'm quite certain that many of these clowns that are on the Internet have been wrong. At, they've already had their one time with me. And I don't listen to, I just don't listen to that stuff. And I just strongly encourage you to turn away from it. But that, that kind of started out with that study. And there's just been something in my mind and my heart. I was praying, asking God about what to preach this week. And um, we're going to deal with the, the subject of knowing, knowing by their fruits. Reaping and sowing, seed and things like that. And it's going to take a little while to get through. I mean, there's a lot in the Bible. If you think about it, consider it. And the Bible is full of fruitfulness, bearing fruit. Third day of creation, God creates seed and fruit-bearing trees and things like that. And there's all kinds of typology in that. But uh, I'm going to kind of start it out this morning this way in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 15. You got your Bibles open, say amen. amen. Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Jesus said in Matthew 24, many, many false prophets shall arise. Many false Christs shall arise. Many shall come in my name saying, I'm Christ and shall deceive many. Second uh, Peter talks about that. Jude talks about that. Paul warned Timothy about it. It's, all, it's in the book of Jeremiah. It's in the book of Deuteronomy. I mean, it's all through the scriptures. God warns. Ezekiel had warnings about uh, those prophets who said God said. And God said, I never said that. They're pinning that on me. And God said, I never said it. So he says, beware of false prophets. And I would say that there's probably more false prophets out there than there are true ones. More false Bibles than there are real Bibles. More false churches than there are real churches. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. They appear as Christians. They appear as Christian-like. They carry the name of Christ. They use the name of Christ or Jesus or God. They mention briefly scriptures but will not dwell in scripture they will not abide in scripture they will always move out they will they will come inside where you are in the scriptures use a few scriptures to pull you out where they are that's how they do it but inwardly they are ravening wolves they are not sheep they're not saved god said they will not be in the writing of my people in other words their name is not written in the book of life. They are not saved. It's not just a, you know, I've got pastor friends all over the country, all over the world, that I would disagree with on, on certain issues relating to Bible and doctrine and things like that. That's not a big deal with me. If I, if I know they believe the Bible, that, I just, they're my friends, they're my brothers. We're all reading out the same book. We just see it differently. I'm probably wrong on this, that. They're wrong on that and so on. And I just don't worry about all that stuff. 
So I'm not talking about differences of doctrine. I'm talking about false doctrine, false gospels, false words that they said God said and God said, I never said. You'll never find it in the Bible anywhere. It's like the idea they made up. The Catholic Church made up. And I had, was thinking about this the other day. They made up the doctrine of worshiping and praying to Mary. Show me that in the Bible anywhere. Show me where Jesus said that. Show me where the apostles taught that anywhere in the scriptures. Show me where it was. I'll tell you where it was in the Bible. It was forbidden to worship Astaroth, which is essentially what that is. They're worshiping Mary as the goddess. She is, in Catholic terminology, the mother of God. There is no such thing. There is no such thing. God never said that. So they made that up. But it goes back to ancient Babylonian cults and all that stuff. So they appear as sheep, but they're not sheep. They're ravening wolves. He said, ye shall, underline this in your Bible, ye shall know them by their fruits. It's very simple. It is very simple. Now, first thing you do with this, judge yourself first. And don't gloss over anything. Usually, at least once a day, God reminds me of who I am. And I, it's not a good time. I mean, I'm having a good time today in church, singing the good songs, and boy, I'm just enjoying everybody's fellowship. It just seems like there's a good spirit here, and... But I, I tell you how it starts with me. It starts with me thinking down at other people, looking down on them. And the moment I start doing that, God reminds me, who, Mike, who are you? What are you? Where did you come? What, remember the pit that I drug you out of? Yeah. Okay, I get it. And it's usually not a fun time spent with, spent with God, I can tell you. But he said, you shall know them by their fruits. So you, you're the first fruits for you to do your inspection on is your own. Let me give you a biblical example of that. Let's pray so I can preach. Father, I ask for your help today as I preach the message. Father, I believe you've given to me for these people. Lord, I don't know who these... I don't know who needs this. I don't know, Lord, what I'm going to say. I don't know, Lord, what's going to reach into somebody's heart. That's not my place. It's not my job. It's not the position you've given me. You've just simply said, preach the word and uh, preach it the way I said it. And Father, help me to do that to the best of my ability. And uh, Father, you supply the grace that's needed and necessary, Lord, for those who need to hear it and those who should hear it, those who you want to hear it, that they, they'll hear it today. And Father, we can make multiple applications out of this message, but Father, let it start with us first. So open our eyes, open our hearts, dear God, and teach us great and mighty things, Father. And uh, use us for the times that we're living in now. Help us to be an encouragement. Help us, dear God, to reach out to people right now who are looking for answers. It's a strange world. We've never seen anything like this in anybody's lifetime. And Lord, it's just different. And I had a feeling it would be this year because of the year that it is. And I just pray, dear God, that you would, uh, Lord, sanctify your people and anchor them. Put it, give them strong cords. Bound them tightly down and anchored so that we drift not away. Father, just anchor us to your word, to your hope. Bless us as we preach this morning. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. The illustration given to us in the scripture, and I'll never forget when I read this. I was talking to Philip earlier about Levite priests and their job. And when you have diabetes, your cells are like a little mini tabernacle and the mitochondria in your cell is what, the, it's the power plants, the batteries. And it needs fuel. And the fuel for all your cells is sugar. Your liver converts everything you eat into sugar, except you eat nails and glass. It doesn't do that very well. But 
Anyway, everything you eat, it converts into sugar, and that sugar flows through your blood, and then when it reaches the cells, there has to be insulin there. Insulin is the only thing in the body that's got the key to unlock the cell wall so the sugar can go in and be burnt for fuel, for energy. And when you have diabetes, you either don't produce any insulin or you don't produce enough of it or something is prohibiting the insulin from opening up the cells and the sugar builds up in the blood and the cells are dying because they don't have any fuel. So this Levite priest standing there at the entrance to every cell. And they were standing there at the entrance to the tabernacle. Levites were the only ones who were supposed to go in there. And the Levite then would, ex when somebody would, a man would come with his children, his wife, and they'd be bringing their county fair prize lamb. Best one that they had. Not the worst one, not the sick one. Best one they had. They would bring that lamb to the Levite priest standing at the entrance to the tabernacle. And that Levite priest was instructed by God himself. Here's what you're going to do before... When you see that family coming with that sacrifice, you know that they've done something wrong. You know they've sinned. When, just like when you, when you pulled in the church parking lot today, everybody knows you're a sinner. Why? Because you came to church. So the Levite priest was instructed this way because God knew that eventually the clergy would always try to hold power over the laity. That's the Nicolaitan doctrine. Jesus said, which thing I hate. Anytime the clergy tries to hold power over the people. So he instructed the Levites, when you see that family coming with that lamb, you're gonna, you know they've sinned. Don't stand there at the gate acting like you ain't never done anything wrong and have an arrogant attitude toward those people because before you offer the sacrifice for their sin, you have to offer the sacrifice for your own first. First. Then, then you can do theirs. But you do yours first. And I'm reasonably sure that, that there was at, at, at times godly men who were priests of the Lord, who stood and offered sacrifice for their own sins, then offered the sacrifice for the people. That was written into the law to keep the clergy from being high and mighty over everybody sitting in the pews or everybody in the, in the camp. And it's supposed to be that way with me. It's supposed to be that way with you. That when we see people up and down the street, when we see people about the way, when we see people that we work with, our neighbors, our family members, we are to remind ourselves first, before we go picking at them, we're to pick at ourselves first. So he said, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns? The answer is no. Do men gather figs of thistles? The answer is no. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Uh, when we were at Rich Woods, there was a, a deacon out there, and he had a, had a farm. He had cattle on that farm. He had a pear tree. Boy, I really like fresh pears, man. And he told me about it, and we was out there having dinner with him one Sunday after church, and he showed me that pear tree. And I said, boy, there's, there's pears on there. I said, are they ripe? He said, yeah, but he said, they ain't fit to eat. I said, what do you mean? He said, that tree's been there for as long as I can remember. And he said, it's never, ever produced one decent pear ever. It has pears hanging on it every year. And he said, watch this. And he made a call out to the cattle. And they came over there and he went shaking that tree. And the pears are dropping and the cows are eating them. The cows love them. But he said, they're not fit to eat. They're just, there's just something wrong with that tree and its genetics that it cannot produce. It's never produced good fruit and never will. And that always stuck in my mind as the example of what he's talking about here. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, cast into the fire. What does that tell you? He's not talking necessarily just about trees. He's talking about souls of men. He's talking about us. If you do not 
bear or bring forth good fruit. You are corrupt and you are to be hewn down and you will be cast into the fire. And Jesus said, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. So let's go back now to, let's turn to Romans 7. I was ready to go to Genesis, but my note said go to Romans. So we're going to Romans. Romans 7. Paul then, I think, connects this perfectly. And he's, he illustrates here the two types of fruit. And understand that in any Christian, and, and I'm going to preach this to you and I'm going to preach this to everybody watching online, because I've had people call me. Uh, I'm, peop, there's people all over the world call me pastor. And I take that seriously. I've had people call me from... Literally the four corners. In some cases, confessing sins. Not that I would forgive them, not for my forgiveness. But because they struggle, and they struggle then with the idea, am I saved? Because I can't, they'll tell me, Pastor, I can't, I can't shake this. I can't, I can't get it off of me. No matter what I do, it's, it's always there, and I don't, I don't want it. I said, well, welcome to Christianity 101. Because you ain't no different than anybody else I know. So Romans 7 really then illustrates perfectly the difference between what the flesh does and what our soul does. And in a, in a lost person, they're not different. In a saved person, they are. And that is, I guess, if you want to call it the secret of Christianity or the, the foundation of Christianity, is that there's two of me. The inner man, and the outer man. The outer man is what you're seeing. The inner man is what's preaching. It ain't coming out of my flesh, I guarantee you that. So if you ever want to understand the difference, Romans 7 tells you the difference. Paul said there's two laws, just like in your Bible, there's Old Testament and New Testament, there's two laws. One governs the flesh, the other one governs the spirit. And let me tell you something, your flesh is never leaving this earth, ever. It's, it was born here and it's going to stay here. Well, what about the resurrection? That flesh is not going to heaven. You don't want it. God ain't going to let it in. Amen. What, do you want a backache for eternity? <laughs> you want senility for, the, for everlasting life? No way. So he says, verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And understand something. Now, I'm probably going to emphasize this more later on, but I'm going to say it now. As a Christian, as a young pastor here, I made lots of mistakes because I thought that it was up to me to produce the fruit of people in this church. That it was up to me to do it. And I was wrong. And God had to whip me several times over that to convince me how wrong I was. God does not command you to produce fruit. He commands you to bear fruit. There's a difference. Bearing the fruit is almost going to be like a second nature to you. It's like you're breathing now and you have no idea. You had not had to tell yourself you've been to breathe the last hour. You've been breathing all this time, right? Okay? Nobody had to tell you to do You didn't have to tell yourself to do that. And that's how it is. God will bring forth and manifest the fruit in you. He just asks you to bear it. Okay? It's that simple. It really is that simple. So he says, verse, um, we should bring forth fruit unto God. Verse 5, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So he 
mentions two different types of fruit here in these two verses. The fruit that we bring forth unto God is, comes from the inner man. The fruit that works in our members. Think of what your members of your body are. Your hands, your eyes, your ears. The whole rest of your body. I'm not going to get into all that, but that's your body. That's your flesh. And it's done terrible things. Has it not? Okay? So that was the law which worked in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Every part of your outer man is going to die. Every part of it. It's going to rot. It's going to corrupt. It's going to be in the grave. God's going to burn it up at the end of everything. He's going to burn it up with a fervent heat. The elements are going to melt. It's going to be vanished away. It's going to be done away with. But it, so he mentions the two fruits here. The ones that we produce or that we bear unto God. The ones that we bear in our flesh. And understanding the difference, I think, is essential to understanding your role in salvation. Who really is saved and who isn't? Okay? Now, Genesis 3. This will be maybe more on the lines of teaching. Maybe a little preaching involved in it. But just to give you an understanding... Because here in a minute, I'm going to preach on whatsoever you sow, that shall ye also reap. Are you ready for that? Okay? Because I got something I want to say that, you know, it just kind of occurred to me lately. Is that even though God has forgiven your sins, aren't you glad God forgave your sins? Say amen. God forgives your sins. But did you not sow corruption? So what is to be done with what you sowed? You can't unsow it. That's like trying to unsay words. Right? You ever tried to unsay words? Some people don't let you. Once you say things to certain people, they don't ever, they, they're, you're, you're done. You can apologize and be sorry and everything else and, and truly mean it. But it was out there and you can't, that's like trying to put water back in the bucket. It don't all go back, does it? So I want you to think about that. You say, well, I thought God forgave my sins. Why, am I, why am, I, am I still being punished for that? You sowed it. You sowed it. It's a man I know. He's now gone on to be with the Lord. He's in heaven. But when he was lost... He made kids all over the place. Made babies everywhere. Some he knew about, some he never knew about. He used to laugh about it, joke about it. Just because he got saved and he's in heaven, that doesn't take away what he did. Kids were born because he sowed corruption everywhere and you have to live with that that's hard amen Genesis 3 now the serpent this is where we get this word I get my ideas for the mark of the beast from I don't think the false prophet is gonna jam a gun down somebody's throat and say you either take this or we'll blow your brains all over the place I don't think it's going to happen that way. I think people are going to choose it. They're going to want it. He's going to talk them into it like the devil talked Eve into that tree. What was on that tree? Fruit, right? Now, let me ask you this. Think about this. What's inside that fruit? 
a lot more trees and a lot more fruit because a tree when you plant a seed in the ground the tree grows and the, puts out a fruit it doesn't just put out one seed in it or it doesn't just put out one seed in its lifetime it puts out a bunch of them that's how God designed it right dogs they don't just have one puppy they have a litter is it a litter or is that cats I'm thinking a kitty litter never mind anyway don't you think about that think about what's think about what's going on here think about the illustration he's telling you the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and he said unto the woman yea if God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden and the woman said unto the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God has said ye shall need it not eat of it neither shall you touch it lest ye die and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now he was lying, and he knew he was lying. But Eve didn't know he was lying. Or maybe, maybe she did, and she just chose not to believe what God said. Maybe she just chose to believe the lie. You know, some people do that. Because the lie sounds better, doesn't it? In some cases. Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw, first off, saw, tree was good for food, lust of the eyes, number two, that it was, or lust of the flesh, number two, that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, number three, a tree to be desired to make one wise, that's pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, gave also under her husband with her, and he did eat. And God said no. So now think about that fruit. Okay? Think about all the things. And I know this is a little tough. But think about all the things God told you not to do, but you did it anyway. Or all the things that God told you to do and you didn't do it anyway. You didn't do it simply because you didn't want to do it. So you left it undone or you did it and you shouldn't have done it. All of those things that you did are never undone. Ever. Once they're done, they're done. And there's no taking it back. This is one of those things to get us to think about why we shouldn't do certain things or why we should do certain things. So now turn to Proverbs. And here's, here's where we're going with this. Even though you are saved, That may not necessarily remove the fact that you're going to reap what you sowed. Here's what some people hope for. When I talk about hope and preach about hope, hope is knowing that what God said he'll do, he'll do. Believing that if God said, I will save you. Believing that if God said, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in the heart God raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. That's hope. Hope. So when I lead somebody to the Lord and they ask, you know, I want to be saved and I pray with them, I ask them, do you believe now that Jesus has forgiven all your sins? Yes, I do. Why do you believe that? Because God said so. That's hope. I hope He does. And hope is not wishing. Hope is not a wish. Toss a penny into the well and, and wish that it comes true. It's not. It's more than that. It's knowing that if God said it, the Word doesn't go out of His mouth and God go, oops, I shouldn't have said that. Now I'm going to have to bless them and I don't want to bless them. If God blesses you, He wanted to. Amen. 
If God had mercy on you, it's because He wanted to have mercy on you. If God forgave you, it's because He wanted to forgive you. Okay, amen. He wanted to do that. It's not a mistake with God. But here's what else hope is not. Hope is not the belief that if I just confess, if I go down to the altar, then I will be excused from all consequences of all of my actions. It doesn't work that way. As seen by the Old Testament when because of the sins of a man and his family, they had to bring the county fair prize winning lamb down and have it killed. Your sin, the Bible's telling you, it's full of telling you that your sin is always going to cost you something. And we're paying the price now for somebody's stupidity with this virus. Irresponsibility. People pay the price for their sins of adultery and fornication by diseases. God put them in this world because of that. You've, it's consequences for what you've done. And there are all kinds of costs because of the things we've done. And just because you ask God for forgiveness, that doesn't mean that He's going to remove then all of the consequences for what you've done. You sowed, you sowed the seed. There was a young man that, when I was in Bible college out in Oklahoma, it was a, it was a very famous case. He was... His name was Sean Sellers, and he was on death row for killing his mother, his stepfather, and a convenience store clerk in Oklahoma during the 80s. Uh, he was the young, he was 16 years old, the youngest man on death row in Oklahoma history, and they executed him. But he got saved when he got to prison. He got saved, and they allowed him to do a few interviews and, and work with some ministries there to try to... What, what happened was he got mixed in with some of these occult role-playing games and his life was just full of devils. And they just took over one night and he killed his mom, killed, a, killed his stepdad, cold blood, convenience store clerk when he went to, I don't know the whole story, but he ended up killing three people in one night. Now, he got saved in prison. Did that, does that remove the death penalty? No! The demands of the law had to be satisfied. And I'm sure he had a lawyer that said, well, look at him now. Look what he's doing. He's doing some good things. Maybe we should let him live. And the governor said he's still got a crime to pay for. And I'm not commuting the sentence. And I'm here to tell you, you'll bear to your grave the marks, the scars, and the costs, and the fruit, the corrupt fruit of the things you've done, even if you're saved. Proverbs 1, verse 28. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. Now, how, I'm, I'm, now this, is an, this is in a case where phew, you ought to be glad it's not you. You're here because you want to be here. I didn't call you and say, look, if you don't show up for church this Sunday, I'm going to, I'm going to throw you out and kick you out and you're not going to heaven. I didn't do anything like that. You came here because you wanted to be here. Amen? That is a sign that God's still working in your life. You ought to tell Him thank you for that. That he did not turn you over. Because he said, they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. That's what he did to Saul. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore, look at what it says. They shall eat the fruit of their own way. Did Eve, was she forced? Did she have that fruit shoved down her mouth? No. Did he put it in her throat, clamp her mouth down? No, like trying to get a dog to take a worm pill. You ever had that? Close her mouth and hope they don't spit it out. Make them swallow it. The Bible says she ate the fruit of her own way. See, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life was already in her. It was built into her somehow, some way. It was there already. And she just, the devil just opened up and said, Look here, there it is right there. Gave her the target of her lust. And boom. She did it. Did she die? Yeah. 
And she laid a sentence of death upon every one of her children. And we're it. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 10. You can turn there. You can look up on the screen. I'm going to move through some of this. Say ye to the righteous that it should be well with him for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. It works both ways. Think about what a seed is. Seed is basically words. Blueprints for life. Blueprints for to build something. That's what seed is. You can sow good seed. You can. You can sow good seed into your family. Can you not? Can you not fill the people that you want their love, you want their companionship, if, if that's what you want? You know, the Bible says a man who wants a friend must show himself to be friendly. Why would I want to be your friend if you're a jerk? I don't want to be, if you're a jerk, I don't want to be your friend. Because I'm the jerk. Amen. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can sow a good family just as well as you can sow a bad one. The things you say, the things you do will either sow righteousness and love and warmth into a family. Sherry's dad, God bless him. Sat down with his family every night, read them Bible stories. She's going to carry those memories of her dad for the rest of her life. And she is what she is now in Christ as a result of that. Okay? Okay? But it works the other way, too. You know, they talk about, what, what do they call it? Dysfunctional families? You know what that is? That's just mom and dad sinners. And they're sowing seeds of sin and wickedness into their children. And their children end up being as bad or worse than mom and dad ever was. And then they will bring children into this world. And it just gets, gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Jeremiah 6, 19, Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts. Now we're getting into it. Because now, he, he, earlier he said, the fruit of their, they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Now, they say, well, what if I don't actually do it, but I just think about it all day long? Tell me how that's going to work. What happens? What happens, Roy, if you just sit and think about a bottle of Jack all day long? You go crazy. What happens if you sit and think about taking drugs all day long? You go out and you'll probably end up... What happens if you sit and think about a woman all day long? Or a man? Or money? God said... I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts. See, you can hide your thoughts from people only so long, but eventually you didn't realize you were sowing seeds. And those seeds always seem to see we're made out of what? Dirt. What do you put seeds in? Dirt. What do they grow best in? Dirt. What do they really grow best in? Corrupt dirt. Stinky, nasty, corruption, dirt, table scraps, dirt, fish guts, dirt, corrupt stuff, manure. That's what they grow best in. So you sit and fill your mind all day long with stuff on the internet. What's that going to do to you? See, it used to be TV. Nobody watches TV anymore. We're on the internet. Now it's worse. Because, see, they restrict what comes out over the TV waves. But they don't restrict what comes out over the Internet. 
God said they're going to they're get the fruit of their thoughts because they have not hearkened unto my words nor my law but rejected it. Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. There it is again. It's the fruit of your doings, the fruit of your thoughts. And God said, I will make sure, I will make sure that what you've been thinking and what you've been doing is going to produce the fruit whether you want it to show up or not, it's going to show up. Proverbs 10, verse 16. The labor of the righteous tendeth to life, the fruit of the wicked to sin. So, the labor of the righteous, the righteous are the saints, they're the church people, they're the people who are born again. And if you're truly born again, you just don't spend, you, it's just a, a, a different nature. It's not a have to, you're not doing it because you have to, you do it because you want to. It's a new nature in you that says, I don't want to spend my life in the bondage that I was in before. I don't want that anymore. I want life. I don't want death. I don't want to go back to what I was doing. I don't want to be who I used to be. I want to be something different. And God bless you if you are. Amen. But he said the fruit of the wicked is sin. And remember what I said. Inside that fruit is a lot more sin. So what you do one time, you just don't do it one time, do you? You just didn't, didn't smoke one cigarette. You smoked a carton of them. Proverbs 18, 21. Listen to this. Now, the charismatic church has done wonders with this verse. And they've twisted it into something that it's not. But it does mean what it says. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Let me illustrate it like this. I could, come up, I could stand up here and, and destroy this church by what I say. I could run every one of you out with things that I say. I don't want to do that. I like to keep you. I like you. Okay? I want to keep you here. So I want to sow life into this church by what I say. And it works. I don't care what situation in life you're in. Whether it's a marriage, you're at work. You can talk yourself into a job or you can talk yourself. What do they have before you get a job? You have an interview. And what is that? Do they want to see your muscles? What do they want? Talk to us. So I can get a sense of who you are. And by your talking, I can tell whether or not I'm going to hire you or not. Because if you're a jerk, we've already got plenty of those. We don't need any more. We want some good people that will work. Amen. And they talk. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And love it. What did he mean? Did he mean death or life? Take your pick. See, if you love life, then you will speak life into your family, your job, your church, any relationship you have, your nation, your country. There are people who speak in death in this country right now. Are they not? Let's kill all of our babies. Let's tax everybody. Let's become European socialists. Let's speak death to this country. And it's happening. The Bible's right. Amen. I'm going to cut it off here in a minute. But Jeremiah, let me read these verses to you. Jeremiah 21, 14. I will punish you according to the fruit of your doings. Again, if God removes from you 90% of the things that you sold into this world and you don't get that back on you, that's grace. But I don't know anybody, I don't know anybody who gets a clean slate going through this life once they get saved. There's always the consequences of the things that they did and said. Always. I will kindle a fire in the forest thereof, and it shall devour all things round about it. 
Jeremiah 32, 19, great in counsel and mighty in work for thine eyes are open upon, are open upon all the ways of the sons of men. Here, God, God does this to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Hosea 10, 13, you plowed wickedness, you've reaped iniquity. So what are you going to get out of that? Wickedness and iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies. Because thou didst trust in thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. So if you plow wickedness and you reaped iniquity, you're going to eat the fruit of lies. And again, even though you're saved, born again, trying to walk the straight and narrow, trying to do right, live right, speak right, think right, act right, there's always, always, still some things that we're going to have to reap because we sowed them. I don't like that. The older I get, the more I realize how true that is. Can I hear somebody say amen? The older you get, the wiser you get, the more you realize, I wish I'd never done that. I wish I'd never been there. I wish I'd never said that. I wish I'd never run with those people. But God came, sowed the seed of the Word of God, and it's incorruptible, meaning all of the things that you did cannot take away from what God is going to do in your life. Somebody say amen. Let's bow our heads. I wish my mama would have taught me these things when I was little. She didn't have a big enough belt. That's, that's the thing. I hear that's another thing I've learned. Young people, all the things I'm telling you now, you're going to see it 10, 15 years from now. But it won't stop you from doing what you're going to do. It won't stop you. It won't. You're going to go do what you're going to go do. And God's going to let you remember what this preacher said one day. Then it'll click. And it happens with everybody. Father, we come before you today. And when we look at our lives, we plainly see it. Because we know the seeds that we sowed. We know what we did. And maybe others don't necessarily recognize it in us. But we know it's there. We see it in our own lives, the fruit of our doings, the fruit of our thoughts. And we see it, which is harder, we see it in the lives of our children. And that's hard to take. But Father, it's just, it's a reminder to us that your word is right. And that even though, Father, grace has been very good in our lives. We are not anywhere near what we used to be. But yet, God, there's always that reminder of what we did yesterday and all the yesterdays because the fruit shows up every now and then. God, we all wish we could go back and take it back and not do that. But you don't give us that. 
There are laws that you've laid out that what we, what we sowed, that we, we, we're going to reap it, and there's no getting out of it. But Father, help us to take those things with grace. Give us grace. And we thank you, Father, for the grace that you've given us already in that you have removed a very large portion. You did it with David. You forgave his sin with Bathsheba. But you told him, David, the sword never going to leave your house. And it happened exactly the way you said it. But you love David. He's with you now. And you love us. And we're going to be with you one of these days. But it's not going to be without scars. It's not going to be without a little bit of corruption on us. So Father, help us, dear God, to handle it with grace. That we get not overdrawn in sorrow. That we don't just spend our time mourning and lamenting the mistakes of the past. God, give us grace to understand that even though we can see the fruit of our corruption, we can still see the fruit of righteousness through Jesus Christ. So, Father, bless your word today in the hearts of these people and all those that have heard it. And I thank you, God, Lord, for carrying this voice throughout the world. Let it be a blessing to somebody who needed it today. Somebody who needed lift, somebody needed a, a question answered. They needed reminded, God, that they're still saved. But just some things just don't, you just can't unsow it. That's all there is to it. And the days, the last days when you are ready for harvest, you'll, you'll separate it out. And you'll fix, Father, what's wrong in our lives. And we're thankful for that. And that's the day we look forward to. Remind us of that day, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.